All right, Paul, this is an amazing field that's changing rapidly, and we've learned a lot of things, some stuff that we really didn't expect. So let's think about uh, and summarize what we've learned. Yep, so I guess the first planets were the ones discovered from uh, around pulsars, and they're neat but weird. Yep. The first, what we describe as more normal planets, were discovered by the radio velocity technique. And that started off by finding hot Jupiters, but now it's mostly discovering these eccentric giants. And it looks like maybe 20, 30% of um, solar systems have these things. And when you say eccentric, you don't mean weird. You mean that they're going in orbits that are elliptical as opposed to circles. I mean, they might be weird. We don't know. Yeah, but okay, yeah. they're, they're in weird orbits. So these are things with sort of gas giant masses down to you know, Neptune masses or even super Earths, but in orbits and not. Some of them are nice and circular, like Jupiter, but most of them are in more eccentric orbits. And, and this so, would be quite common. Right, and so that's a place where having more and more time really allows you to improve things. But when we say more and more time, we mean lots of time, like years or even decades. Yeah, so the way the radio velocity field is going is they've now got the precision down to slightly below a meter per second. I don't think they're going to do much better than that because the surfaces of the stars jitter around at that sort of level. So Due to astro seismology and sunspots and all sorts of other yeah. stuff. Yeah. So in some sense, no matter how good your telescopes get, you're going to be limited by the jitter of the stars, which means you're never going to be seeing really small planets except around very small stars that like we've just been talking about. Right. So where you're going to go is you're going to look at more stars, and in particular, you're going to keep the sort of meter per second precision and observe for longer so you can start seeing things at that accuracy further and further out. At the moment, they've been going for nearly 10 or so years and they're starting to see Jupiter analogs. So presumably, they're starting to 20 years, 30 years of data, especially with the sort of meter per second precision, they're going to start seeing more of these things further out. Okay, very good. So um, that's one way to go forth and it will continue to be an important part partially because it's also a good way of just testing to make sure something else isn't happening when you discover them, for example, using transits. So transits, of course, are uh, really blossoming now as well, but we tend to find things that are really close in preferentially. Yes, I mean, just this morning there was a press release talking about a planet that's the closest match to the size of the Earth, the density of the Earth that had been seen, but it was incredibly close in, and so a temperature of thousands of degrees on the surface. So. But it was kind of cool because it has exactly the same density, 5,500 kilograms per meter uh, per meter cube, which is the same as, as the Earth. So that is interesting. It seems to be something similar. So where's the future for transit surveys? Well, it strikes me that, uh, you know, with Kepler being in space now, its mission finished, it's going to be really hard to work at Earth-sized planets from the ground. The atmosphere, even with adaptive optics, you really can't take out that variation in brightness um, well enough to compete with space. But there are plans, of course, for a new satellite called TESS which is going to be like Kepler, except for it's going to look over the entire sky at all the bright stars. And the idea of looking at bright stars is if you do find something going around them, it's relatively easy to follow up by radio velocity and measure the map, and uh, measure the mass, and also um, look at the um, secondary transits and start measuring what they're made of, look, wait till it goes in front and try to look for dips in the spectrum. But, but there's another thing that's interesting about uh, bright stars is they preferentially are the nearby stars, and so that means we can also use these for targets for direct imaging, because that means the objects are going to be further out and easier to see and brighter than otherwise. And it could be these are going to be the first things colonized by the human race when we develop interstellar travel a thousand years from now. So in some sense, that's very exciting for the future. It's going to be probably the end of this uh, sort of in, in sort of 2020 before we start being able to do this. Uh, and this will be worked with the new giant telescopes, which are better at direct imaging. Yep, so what we're learning at the moment from the uh, transit surveys is mostly the super-Earths very close in. This new survey will find maybe even smaller things around nearer stars, and maybe we might start seeing things further out. But no matter how we do it, the radio velocity technique is going to be biased towards close-in things. Uh, Tess is supposed to look at 500,000 stars, right. and so you're going to get a few things further out, but the odds are really against you. So the radio velocity technique is biased to things close in. The transit technique also biased towards things close in. So we're kind of stuffed in terms of getting a full view of, the, uh, of what's going on. And the other problem, of course, we have is when we're looking at these nearby stars, which are, in some sense, the most interesting, for the transits, which are good at finding small things, tests will find, 
you really only have that sort of 5% chance of the orbit being lined up. So for every object we see, we're missing probably 19. So Tess should find a lot of interesting things, but yep. there could well be that some of the closest and most interesting ones are just going to be missing because they're not edge-on enough and they're too small to sharpen in the radial velocity approach. So if we get direct imaging right, that really doesn't have any of these biases. It's hard to see the close-in ones, but it's pretty good at seeing the ones out. And so nearby stars, big telescopes, adaptive optics, we have the potential of moving in and really seeing everything that's interesting. Yes, and the, uh, the uh, direct imaging is one field where bucket loads of money being thrown at it in terms of bigger telescopes and better adaptive optics. So this could be the one over the next uh, 10 or 20 years we're going to see the most progress. And if they can actually start directly imaging smaller planets closer in that aren't so young, that could be very interesting. At the moment, of course, they can only pick up things that are gas giants a very long way out and very, very young. So it could be the really neat nearby planet is Earth-like thing, and it might be around a star that's four billion years old like our sun, so it's cooled down, not going to show up with these things. So funny things like that is going to be a formidable challenge even for the next generation of telescopes. Well, so let's just briefly talk about the next generation of telescopes. We have here in Australia, we're part of the Giant Magellan uh, Telescope Consortium, so that's uh, seven 8.2 meter mirrors put together to make sort of a 25 meter telescope. Yes, and then there's the uh, TMT, the 30 meter telescope, which is a, a consortium of California, Canada, Japan, um, which would have a, a more like Keck with um, button together segments. Yeah, a bunch of little hexagons you put together, and that's a 30 meter, given the name, very original, 30 meter telescope, TMT. So that's a 30 meter telescope that's planned to go in Hawaii on top of Mauna Kea. And the Europeans are also looking at a telescope. Right, so that's the extremely large telescope, equally uh, unique name, ELT, the European ELT. And that's really ambitious. That's like TMT with all these hexagons put together, but to be 39 meters across. So that's the granddaddy of them all. Uh, but the main problem between now and these telescopes seems to be money, because they're very, very expensive. So I think we're just going to have to wait to see uh, how these things uh, pan out and how big they really end up being mm -hmm. because big is expensive when it comes to telescopes. And perhaps the most interesting statistics for these things about a solar system like things has come from microlensing. Where do you think that field is going to go? Well again I think that's uh, time is on our side. We have these amazing survey telescopes like our own SkyMapper here that have huge digital cameras that can monitor tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of stars at a time. And really with these microlensing, it's the more you can look at, the better you do. And then it's just time and we wait. Now you're going to be biased towards things around Earth or maybe a little further out. But in that sense, those are really interesting. The problem is the objects you find are so far away, you can't do the direct imaging on it. So I think it's good to find out the statistics. But again, it's a complementary probe to everything else we're talking about. What oh, would be really nice, though, would be to actually have such a good set of telescopes you can actually you know, look at the continents and the cloud patterns and do all that sort of stuff. So let's calculate what it would need to actually do something like that. 